there is nothing about my growing up period in Sheridan, Oregon, small town girl, 1940s and 50s that would ever make you think about being a governor or a senator or a school board member even. I mean, there were no women role models, none. Uh, you know, you never saw a woman mayor in my small town, uh, no women doctors, no women lawyers, accountants. Uh, I think the only business in my small town that was owned by a woman was beauty shop. And, uh, you know, women were secretaries. So you'd never saw yourself that way. Uh, I describe it sometimes that in the 1950s, when I was in high school, that uh, young girls married and had babies and disappeared into the kitchens of America, never to be seen again. And it was almost the truth. I was salutatorian of my high school graduating class, and no one ever suggested I go to college. Not a faculty member, a counselor, a parent, no one. In the 1950s in small town Oregon, small town America probably, uh, girls just didn't see themselves that way. Well, I was an elected school board member for 10 years on the Park Row School Board. I was uh, on the Mount Hood Community College Board um, before I was elected to the House. Uh, and I was also, um, I, I, I did a number of community service things. I chaired the Juvenile Services Commission for Multnomah County. I served on several boards related to mental health and to children. So I was involved in a lot of community things in that kind of way. And in 1971, the real thing that got me involved in politics was I came down to the legislature one day a week uh, during the 1971 session and lobbied a piece of legislation for uh, educational rights for children with disabilities. It was before the federal law passed that gave children with disabilities educational rights. And we believe it was the first law in the nation that gave kids with disabilities uh, a right to a public school education. And I lobbied that bill through the legislature. Frank was my legislator uh, from my district. Uh, he was um, my mentor, uh, taught me the legislative process. And, uh, and we became friends as a result of the work I did that legislative session. And we actually got, I actually got the bill through in one session. I was green and um, uh, inexperienced and unsophisticated and poor. Uh, I was a single mom with two kids and no child support at the time. And, uh, and I wanted my son to have the right to go to school. And they sent him home and said he couldn't come to school anymore. And so I, um, I just couldn't accept that. So Frank worked with a group of parents from our area and helped us get the bill drafted. And I became the unpaid, really unpaid lobbyist for, for uh, that piece of legislation. And it was my first real political experience. And, uh, I came away from it with a successful piece of legislation, but also an understanding that in this process, in this legislative process, I could affect people's lives. And I found out I was pretty good at it, <laughs> and I liked it. And so it was very hard to ever go back after that and not care about the political process. It was so much a part of how I felt about myself at that point. And, uh, and it changed the lives of hundreds and hundreds of children in Oregon long term and thousands longer term. And uh, so it was a, and out of that, you know, I, I, my son got an education. I, as a parent, I got the satisfaction of that. That's what prompted me to run for the school board. Um, I served on the state committee for parents with uh, emotionally handicapped children uh, in the Department of Education. I served on that committee. and. And my friendship with Frank turned into a love match, and uh, we got married. So I got a husband out of it, too. <laughs> I served three sessions on Frank's staff. Uh, we were married in June of 74, and in January of 75, I served uh, on his staff the 75 session, 77 session, and 79 session. When I came back to the 79 session, I had just served for 10 and a half months as an appointed county commissioner in Multnomah County. So after serving on the county commission for almost a year um, and making big policy choices, light rail, land use, corrections, mental health, big decisions, a little broader than the school board work I had done, I really uh, found I loved decision making and I loved the broader policy areas. So when I came back in the 79 session on Frank's staff, I wanted to be involved at a different kind of level. And the problem I had at the time was um, my state senator was my husband. I obviously couldn't run against him, nor would I have. 
And one of my best friends, George Starr, was my state representative. And I sure couldn't run against him. He and Irene had been great friends of mine. And so I wanted to run. I wanted to vote in the legislature. I wanted to be involved in that at that level. And I couldn't do it because I couldn't run against either one of them. Frank and I went away on a sailing trip. And when we came back, George Starr announced to me that he was not going to run for re-election. I think I rushed him. I don't think he was quite ready to quit. But he just knew how much I wanted to run. And I think he kind of rushed his own retirement plans from the legislature. So in, in 1980, I had the opportunity to run uh, uh, for the legislature, and I felt so ready to do it. Three sessions as a staff person, you know, a session as a lobbyist, um, school board, community college, county commission, I had, I just brought a lot of credentials with me, and I felt so ready to serve in the legislature. So I, I really wanted to be in the House, and I was anxious about running and um, really ready to do it. Frank really believed in women leaders, and he was always an encourager. He was a mentor. He was a supporter. He was a fan, and he just thought I was going to be a wonderful legislator. And when I ran the first time, I had no opponent in the primary and no opponent in the general. Now, that's a pretty nice way to run a, a race for a state representative, but I'd just been county commissioner, and everybody knew me, and in the school board, everybody knew me, you know, from years of being on the school board, and the Roberts name was really familiar at that point in time. And so when I filed, nobody filed against me. And so I had both, in the fall, I had both a Republican and Democratic nomination for state representative. So um, pretty overwhelming victory. <laughs> so the first race was an easy one. I had watched Frank in the legislature as a staff person and as a lobbyist, as a citizen. His willingness to stand up on issues, to be counted and not protect himself politically. If he thought an issue was important, he took a stand on it, and it, he didn't worry about the next election. I used to tell people he worried about the next generation, not the next, le not the next election. That's how he served. He always served that way. So he was a great role model. Gretchen Kafori was a friend, and I had watched her. Uh, we'd, we'd done politics together as young housewives in East Multnomah County, and after she was elected to the legislature, she took some really tough stands and really, I just, I liked so much how she served and, um, and felt really positive about her as a legislator. And I watched her as a role model when I was serving on Frank's staff. Maureen Newberger was a role model for me. Even though she was out of office by the time I was in office, um, I had watched her for years uh, at events and speaking and been in meetings where she was and listened to her uh, talk about her role in both the Oregon legislature and in the U.S. Senate. Um, I just thought she was the most marvelous woman. And it was so unusual to have a woman who'd been U.S. senator in our state that she was really uh, one of the few women with that kind of political stature, and she was great to watch. The other woman was a Republican, um, and that was Nancy Riles from Washington County. And I had known Nancy for a long time because of school board work and, and other things that we had worked on together outside of the legislative process. And uh, I just, I thought she was one class act. Uh, everything she did was classy, uh, tough stand, easy stand, didn't matter. She was just classy about how she did it. And she had this way of moving people with her class. I mean, she, rather than being confrontive, she was a woman who learned how to use her intelligence and her style to get people to pay attention to her. And in paying attention, she often moved people. And I found that really impressive. Uh, you know, we used to kid Nancy because she had been a Rose Festival queen. And, uh, you know, we always kidded her about that. But the truth was, in that period of time, most of the women who were elected to that legislature in, in those, that period right then, um, in the late 70s and early 80s, we used to joke, most of us had been, in high school, had been cheerleaders. Almost all of us. And it was because there weren't a lot of ways for young women in high schools to stand out. You could never be the student body president, ever. That was just a boy's job. And so in order for girls, I mean, there weren't girls' athletics, really, and there were just not a lot of places for girls to shine. 
cheerleaders. You shined, you know? You, you, it was a sort of leadership role in a way. And um, so it used to be a joke that a whole bunch of us used to be uh, cheerleaders <laughs> and Nancy among them. So yeah, she was, I really had a lot of respect for her. When I did not have a real race in 1980, I put some of my energies into helping other people get elected. A number of people who were running that time in Multnomah County, Democratic members running for the legislature, I got involved in their campaigns helping them because I didn't have a tough race. And that was really true of my second race as well. So I put a lot of time into, uh, I started working on helping recruit Democratic candidates around the state and work with Bill Bradbury and Grant and Karens and others who were recruiting candidates. So I got involved with a lot of new candidates, uh, many of whom were successful. And so th those candidates, when they became legislators, saw me as a leader. Uh, so I had an advantage going in, I think. And actually, the two final candidates in the race for, um, for a majority leader of the House were Bill Bradbury and myself. Bill and I both came into the House together as freshmen in uh, 81. And we, uh, I mean, we clearly, with among our classmates, if you will, uh, were pretty much leadership folks in that group. But it was, I want to go back just a minute, just a minute to talk about something about 1981. There were 19 freshmen in the 81 class, I think. Ten of them were New Democrats. And if you looked at those people today, Darlene Hooley, Barbara Roberts, Peter Courtney, Bill Bradbury, Shirley Gold, I mean, these were people who, some of them still serve in leadership positions in the state, and many of them, Dick Springer, I mean, a lot of them were, you know, moved up in the political arena uh, quite a ways. Margaret Hendrickson was in that class, who ran for the, uh, for the U.S. Senate at one time, though she didn't win. She was brave enough to take on a U.S. Senator. Um, so it was a really strong freshman class. Lonnie Roberts was in that class, who's on the county commission now in Multnomah County. So they, they were a group of people who were clearly leaders, and they stayed leaders for a very long time, even up until now. So the other thing that was true about the 81 session was for the first time in the state's history, there were 19 women in the House. I believe it was the most women who'd ever served in the Oregon House before. And so having the experience of coming in as, as a, a leader among the Democratic new members and a leader among the women of both parties who were there, I came out of that session with a lot of um, expectations my own expectations and others' expectations of me, I think. And so then when I was recruiting candidates, those candidates looked at me and saw me in a leadership way as well. So even though Bill and I were very competitive in the run for majority leader, um, I, I think I came with some extra assets that in maybe my long-term service on Frank's staff, other kinds of things were People never really treated me like a freshman when I came into the Oregon House. I never got treated like a freshman. I was on the speaker's leadership uh, uh, council or whatever they called it the very first session. And so I think I came with some advantages. So even though Bill and I were competing against each other, it was a very friendly competition. And um, I eventually got more votes and became majority leader. Um, and I, th I took the position um, with a great deal of a sense of needing to get more professional about how we did the job. So the first thing we did was clean up the office and make it not look like a campaign office. People thought it was really funny because I cared about that. But I thought, as Democrats, we should present ourselves professionally if we expected to be treated professionally. But for many people in the lobby, it was a real adjustment. It was used to it was the place they were used to hanging out. You know, Grant and Karens had been majority leader before I was, and they used to hanging out there. And suddenly you had these guys who were used to hanging out there, and they didn't know how to hang out in a place that had plants and nice magazines. And, and so it wasn't quite as much of a comfortable hangout as it had been before. But we, the, the members of the caucus really got more professional. Uh, we looked at what kind of money we'd been raising, which was almost nothing and said why why aren't we raising more money to help our candidates and why don't we have a 
why don't we have a report that comes out about what we consider our successes at the end of each session so we just we added a bunch of new things that hadn't been done before and then were done for many years afterwards and I, I think still are I kept a really close eyes on my members um, we had a member that session who was having um, an alcohol problem and uh, I mean it, this sounds awful but she nobody would ever told her how to control that or what that it was a problem before and I remember taking her aside and saying you can't do this this is not okay you have to get hold of this you need to get some help and then I took about five lobbyists aside and said if I ever hear that you've taken a case of booze to her office again I'm going to talk about it on the house floor I mean they were making her situation worse and really catering to it and it was I never saw anything quite like that but that was I figured if they were a member of my caucus my job was to help them um, be better legislators and um, be better public servants and so you know we worked on things we worked on speeches um, we worked on voters pamphlet pages we worked on photography I mean I wanted to give them more tools to do their job both their political job and their professional job better and I think we did that. I think in that two years we really upgraded the, the work of the caucus, and I, I was, I felt very good about it. And, and um, there was not much question in my caucus about my leadership. I mean, nobody really. I mean, I served on the revenue committee, and it was a that's a hard committee, and it meets every single morning. And it was a period of time that we were in recession. We didn't have enough money to go around. People were talking taxes all the time. They were talking sales taxes. So the the, com the committee itself was controversial, and but it meant that I brought to my caucus members a knowledge of what was going on in that revenue committee that was critical to them when they went home and talked to their citizens, and it was critical to them in our caucus as we tried to make decisions. So it was an extra tool that I had that I could bring to the caucus members during that period of time, and uh, it, was, it was fun. I, I enjoyed being majority leader. I felt sometime like a counselor at a, at, you know, at a kid's camp, but... Um, you know, because when the kids fight with each other, you have to pull them apart and make sure they don't kill each other. And, you know, I remember Shirley Gold and Vera Cass just at each other's throat. One was cheering. Vera was uh, cheering ways and means, I think. And I, Shirley was on the revenue committee. I can't remember. But anyway, whatever it was, they were on each other all the time. And we used to laugh about those two Jewish women from New York who couldn't get along but uh, but you know it's part of a job of a majority leader to keep the majority a majority and part of what you do is you have to teach them how to get along with each other when they disagree and there were a lot of big uh, budget issues that year because of the recession that were really dividing our members some who thought the money should be spent on education some who thought the money should be spent on local government and those were big issues during those times so it was a it was a heart and we had special sessions a number of special sessions as well because of the recession so that that um, that pushed people a lot harder than they were used to being pushed and you know we really worked we really worked hard to be to be professional on the floor and I expected members to be prepared and carry bills and if they weren't prepared to carry them to have somebody else take the job I mean I really worked at, to help them think about themselves professionally. And um, I think there was a lot of improvement on the part of some of the members when they really pushed themselves to be more professional. It was, it was fun to watch. Well, obviously, one I just mentioned, the whole issue of the recession and taxation and budget, uh, big issues during the time I served. Um, it was also a time when there was a, where was a lot more focus on women's issues. Uh, women's health issues. Uh, I remember um, uh, a bill in committee that that talked about um, insurance policies covering um, breast reconstruction after cancer. Insurance policies in Oregon didn't cover that then, didn't require them to be covered. They co covered hair transplants for men but not breast reconstructions for women. It was amazing. And so I, I served on the committee that worked on that issue and uh, so there were a number of things like that. We were looking at child care and women's health issues and mammograms and pap smears and, and um, just things that, you know, women's credit, you know, making sure they were being treated with insurance and credit the way that men were. There was really some focus on women's issues during that time and in the session, two sessions before that. So I think it would, 
just having more women in the legislature made a difference in how those issues were, were done. Um, we did a lot of senior citizen stuff. We had um, um, a senior services um, division created in the Department of Human Services during that time. Um, we had had several measures on the ballot re that were tax limitation measures, so that made the legislature focus on was, what was the issue with property taxes and what did we need to do about them. I mean, you know, the last measure just barely not passed. It was just failed by, you know, a few hundred votes. And so that issue kept coming up. What do we do about the property tax? How do we get property tax relief to senior citizens and low income? So that issue, we spent a lot of time on that issue, I remember. There were the, sort of the first rumblings, I think, since land use and um, uh, and Senate Bill 100 had passed, there were, there were some more environmental issues that began to kind of rise to the surface during that time. And there were co conflicts between where, how you improve the economy if you did improved environmental choices at the same time. And, you know, the false choice of environment versus um, jobs was constantly being discussed. There was a lot of talk about international trade during that period. It was when Oregon was first, uh, was first a really, I mean, Vic Atiyah was the governor and Governor Atiyah really liked international trade. And so there was a lot on both the House and Senate committees talking about international trade and seeing Oregon as an international player. And I think that was a fairly new thing for a lot of legislators. The other thing, there had been a measure on the ballot, I, I think it was in 78, I'm not sure, that sort of dealt with open meetings laws for the legislature. Even though school boards and others had open meetings laws, the legislatures weren't quite as clear. And so there had been a measure, it seems like it might have been in 78, that was on the ballot that clarified the responsibility of the legislature to open open up its doors and its windows and bring in the sunshine to the legislative process so there weren't so many things being done behind closed doors. And that, I think, changed the, the way the legislature began to operate during those years. And so, the, but it, you know, so much of what we did in those years, at least for the most part, was focused on budget and taxation, just a huge part of what we did in those, in the four years I served. I think one of the, things I feel most sad about is is how little the press and um, media, how little attention they pay to the legislature. Unless there's a crisis or somebody does something bad, they, they just don't cover the legislature like they used to. A little bit more here in Salem because the Statesman is a local paper, but you know, the coverage we used to get on bills and hearings and legislative issues, um, the the cameras that were in these every day up in these galleries watching floor speeches and debates and and decision making i mean that is very different than it was they pay so little attention to the legislature maybe that's why people feel so negative about the legislature the public is is because the only time they cover it is when there's some kind of a fight or a partisan battle or whatever they don't cover the good stuff that's happening when really good decisions are being made and I think back then we got credit for good choices and good decisions and people saw legislators doing their job a lot more than they do now. I also have some concern now that that there's not as much sunshine in the legislature as there once was. That more of the decision making is occurring with legislative leaders um, behind closed doors with leaders of both houses and both parties together but the legislators themselves in a mass not being included in the same way. Um, I'm not talking about caucuses. I think caucuses are perfectly okay. I don't have any problem with party caucuses. But I do have a problem with decision making being done by so few people and, um, and then the, the expectation that everybody will follow suit once they've negotiated. I think negotiating can come back into the public a lot more and it'd be a lot healthy. You know, people think, well, they see us fighting, they won't like us. Well, they don't like you now. Uh, so, you know, bring the legislative process back into the sunshine. And I think that I really have questions about that part of the operation. I think one of the other things in my recollection, and I think this is accurate, is that when I served in the legislature and in the years before that, 
a lot of people who served in the legislature have been on city councils, been on county commissions, been on school boards, community college boards. They had made public decision, done public decision making in their local communities. They'd done up close and personal with a school board decision or close a building or take away the chocolate milk or whatever those things are that make people so angry in, in school board decision making or the city council or the mayor. They'd done that local government and then come to the legislature. So you had a lot of people who had been making public decisions for a long time. It seems to me that most of the legislators who come now to this building, way and above the majority of them, have not served at local level at all. And they come without knowing what it's like to make a decision with people staring you in the eye. There is a lot of difference between making a decision on the floor of this legislature where your constituents are all home in some other part of the state and not watching you and making a decision on a county commission or a city council or a school board where the people you're making the decision about and for and to are looking right across the desk at you while you do it. I think you become a better decision maker when you've done that local government decision making. You've, you've had the pressure, you've had the people screaming at you in the supermarket because they don't like what you've done and you learn to deal with it. And if the first time you've made a public decision is here in this building and you've got lobbyists talking to you and you're trying to figure out what to do and you don't know what to do about the pressure and you can't figure out how to make a choice without making people mad, well, if you've done school board work very long, you've learned that you have to make decisions that make some people mad. And I think that's a liability. I, you know, if I had my way, nobody would be able to serve in the legislature until they'd served in local government or school boards. Uh, I know that's not realistic, but that would be my choice. And I, I feel the same way. I wouldn't let people serve in statewide office who'd not served in the legislature. Can't make that happen. It's not constitutional. But I think that's how strongly I feel about that learning process about making local government decisions and then being w willing to look at it on a statewide basis, um, I think you're a better legislator. And I think that's one of the things I think is lacking in the legislature right now. It's just not enough of that. I think serving in the state legislature is one of the most exciting government things I ever did. There's so many issues. It's so broad-based. I mean, you've got people on all sides of every issue and sometimes are on the opposite side of you because the geography that they represent is different or the party they represent is different uh, or they see the world differently because they live in an agricultural area and you live in a city. I think the opportunity to learn more about the state and to learn about people of different views in different parts of, of the geography of Oregon is really a wonderful opportunity. And so the, when you serve in the legislature for a while and you served on a local government committee one time and you served on revenue another time and you served on human resources the next time and you served on a high tech, you know, economic development committee, the, the breadth of information to be garnered from that is tremendous. Um, and I, I just think the legislature is one of the most educational uh, political opportunities that exist in the state. And you meet people with all kinds of views, you get a chance to hear them. If you do the job right, you get a chance to really hear what they're saying to you, even if you disagree with it. And I think you're, you're a broader based decision maker if you've done that job right. Uh, I just can't tell you how much I love serving in the legislature. I love the vote counting. I love speaking on the floor. Um, I love debating on the floor. Um, I love debating in the committees. I love the citizens who came to the committees and expressed their pros and cons on legislation. Um, I think it is one of the most positive opportunities you have as a citizen to serve is in the legislature. And uh, I am so grateful for that experience and that I went into statewide office with that experience. I think I was a better statewide office holder because I had that experience. When Frank was in the legislature, he served on the Revenue Committee um, a couple of different times in the Senate and House. And I used to say to him, how do you stand that boring committee? He'd come home and tell me what they did, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's the most boring thing I've ever, how do you sit through those committee meetings? And then I got indoctrinated by him as to how exciting revenue issues could be and 
how how much they affected people and you know how the design was so important and the details were so important and he got me hooked and then when I asked for a committee when I was a freshman and I asked for the revenue committee and got on it and then I loved the revenue committee so he used to make fun of the fact that he had really indoctrinated me into the joys of the revenue committees well, Senate Bill 100, the land use bill, uh, a remarkable legislative coup. Uh, one of the most complex, thoughtful, imaginative, visionary pieces of legislation I think that ever came out of this building. The other one was the Oregon Health Plan. People forget that uh, when John Kitzhaber started designing the Oregon Health Plan, it was a couple of sessions in design. I mean, it, it wasn't something that came through one session. It was really a package of bills that became the Oregon Health Plan. But it, it went through a lot of committee work on both the House and Senate side and, um, and actually passed the legislature before it was funded and before the federal waivers were done or anything. But that package was so complex and so detailed and so creative uh, and the people who worked on it uh, really s saw the world through new eyes in terms of health care and the needs of Oregonians in that field. So always think of that as one of those really amazing things that the legislature did. In the economic development field there were some things that the legislature did sometimes with the leadership of the governor who was in place at that time I think of the regional strategies program that uh, Neil Goldschmidt uh, introduced um, with the help of the Senate and House uh, Economic Development Committees. And to say that, you know, instead of looking at economic development, job creation, and, and getting new business into Oregon, instead of looking at it in some kind of a singular way, we needed to look at it as it affect all the regions of the state. And so, They'd get several counties together and they'd become a regional uh, base for economic development and then that county and its cities and its leadership would decide what they needed to do to create regional economic strategies for that area and then there would be monies to help them do that. And the, uh, Governor Goldschmidt really was one of the um, uh, people who brought that to light. I think Wayne Fawbush and there were others who worked on it. but. It was a very creative way to look at economic development, and the legislature really, um, really worked to make it a viable program. The workforce development that I did when uh, I was governor, the legislative committees took that and said, there's got to be a way to really look at preparing our workforce. It's not just education, and it's not just kids graduating from high school or college, but it's people coming off of welfare. And, people coming out of the timber industry that new, need a new kind of work and people coming out of the prison system and people who are disabled. I mean, we had, we had to look at the workforce in a very broad way and the legislature was incredibly um, creative in working on that uh, particular set of issues about how you got a prepared workforce and seeing the workforce as very broad, very broad, um, and not just, you know, high school graduates college graduates and that was the end of it. It just didn't work that way and they were very wise to understand that. So I think there were a lot of those things were very broad-based long-term solutions. Vera Katz work on education reform, though it's not very popular today, um, it was really a very creative way. I didn't agree with it always, but it was a very creative way to measure whether our kids were graduating from high school with any educational credentials. And uh, so I think the legislature in many, on many occasions has done very, very creative work. And, uh, and they did, they've done some creative work uh, in co combination with local government and, uh, and the federal government in terms of things like light rail and, and transportation issues. And the package they brought out of this last legislature, the governor's package on, tra on uh, uh, bridges and highways, that public works, it's the biggest public works uh, program that's come out of the legislature in 50 years and it didn't get very much attention but I thought the work they did and the legislature's willingness on a bipartisan basis to get that through the legislature was remarkable 
and it's going to mean jobs for Oregonians and better roads and better bridges and you know it nothing like that's really happened in this state for a very long time so I think the legislature's done some really remarkable long-term work sometimes it doesn't last sometimes the governor changes and the work goes away or somebody has a different set of priorities or whatever but some of those things you know if you think of the Oregon Health Plan even diminished financially now and you think of the land use laws and you think of a lot of those things that were done they're still working and they're still in one fashion or another they've stayed in place a very long time well it's really interesting after being in the house for four years and being majority leader um, I knew that I knew that if I stayed I could be speaker Grant and Karen's was going to run statewide, and if I stayed in the House, I, would, I could be the first woman Speaker of the House. I really wanted to do that. I really did. But I also knew there were other people prepared in the House to be Speaker. I, there were a number of qualified people who could do that. I didn't have to do it. And Norm Paulus was um, finishing eight years and could not run again for Secretary of State. And I looked around to see if there was a Democrat prepared to st step in and do it. And there wasn't. I mean, or it didn't appear there was. And I decided I was going to run statewide for Secretary of State. Um, and I announced pretty early. Um, I'd uh, been around the state a lot during that period of time. I thought I brought some good credentials uh, into a statewide race. I knew the state well. Um, I knew nobody could outwork me. Um, I thought I had some good issues that I could um, deal with because of some of the work I'd done in the legislature and as a school board member and community college board member. I, I just felt I had, and local government, um, I knew people all over the state um, who were local government people that I knew or were uh, women that I'd worked with on the women's movement or were part of the disability community. On the other hand, I was taking a risk. I knew I could be reelected. I had a sure win back to the House and a pretty good chance of being Speaker. And I gave those both up to take really a long shot race in some respects. Um, when you knew a Democrat hadn't held the office for 114 years, you didn't figure that the, the odds were with you. State Senator Jim Gardner got in that primary against me. He was a young attorney, um, very well educated. Uh, Frank and I had helped him get elected to the Senate. Um, we'd done all of his campaign photography for his brochures. We'd uh, written most of his campaign brochures Frank and I designed. Uh, Frank had been his political mentor and we'd been, I'd sort of been, uh, I sort of was his campaign mentor and Frank was his sort of legislative mentor getting into the process and we really helped him get elected. So we knew him pretty well. But he decided he wanted to be governor and that the stepping stone to governor was to get elected secretary of state. So he got into that primary race. And he raised more money than I did. And he talked a lot about running for governor two years later and um, that you should elect him secretary of state because he was going to be governor. And you know you wanted to get in on the ground floor, I guess. And so Jim and I campaigned all over the state, and um, uh, it was it was a really interesting campaign. Uh, he was the gubernatorial candidate running for secretary of state, and I was a I was the secretary of state candidate running for secretary of state. And he took a lot of guff from the papers. Some of the papers did not like him talking about running for governor when he was running for secretary of state. I'm, the Ben Bullitt and the Eugene paper, a number of other papers, really did not like that. They didn't think that was an appropriate way to talk about running for Secretary of State. So he, he took some heat about that. I ended up beating him handily in that race, handily. And I had a very strong win coming out of the primary. Then I went into the general, and Donna Sejan was the Republican nominee. She had had a competitive primary as well, not quite as competitive as mine, but um, competitive enough and so she came out of that race as a Republican nominee. In that year Donna and I were actually the only two statewide candidates in the nation who were running against each other as the Democratic and Republican nominees in a statewide race. It just happened to be that there were no others that year so Donna and I were 
getting some attention not only here but nationally because we were running against each other for Secretary of State. And then um, an independent got in that race, uh, a guy named Don Clark from Eugene. He was a television newscaster out of Eugene, and he got in that race as the independent. So there were three of us in the general election. You know, sometimes in wanting to do the right thing, you do something really stupid. We wanted to be totally accessible. Don and I were collaborative kind of women candidates, you know. We wanted to be totally accessible. And Don Clark was a television guy. Of course, he was very comfortable being accessible. He was used to speaking in front of the public all the time. So we started agreeing to debates, you know, League of Women Voters in Forest Grove and somebody else here and somebody else there. Before we finished, we had had 16 debates in the general election for Secretary of State. Any one of us could have delivered anybody else's remarks. As the race went on, one of the issues going on in that campaign, or at least affecting that campaign, was the Rajneesh. The Rajneesh Purim controversy was going on at the same time about bringing people in and registering them to vote in, in uh, Antelope and about who these people were and what they were doing in our state and what kind of, were they a cult, weren't they a cult, Did, were they registered, were they citizens, I mean it was just every kind of controversy that you could believe going on. And Norma Paulus as Secretary of State was talking about it because of it, its effect on that office. And um, so Don Clark got really tough on the issue and Donna quoted Norma a lot on the issue. And I tried to be a little careful because I thought it was a tinderbox. There were people with guns at Rajneesh Purim, and there were people with guns in Eastern Oregon and Central Oregon, and I worried that this was something that could flare into a really mess. Um, and so I, I didn't think I needed to throw matches into the, onto the gasoline. I talked about the fact that Regardless of people's religion, they had a right to vote in Oregon if they were citizens of the country and registered to vote in Oregon. They had a right to vote here. And uh, that we didn't turn Catholics or, or Methodists or anybody else away from the polls because we might or might not, might agree or not agree with the religion. And that if they were residents, they had a right to vote and we needed to be careful about um, throwing around some of the terms that were being thrown around about cults and other things. So I tried to be responsible about talking about it in terms of election law and accessibility to the, to the polling place and uh, religion not being part of a discussion about voting. So I got some really good editorials about my being responsible about this. And, and, but it was an issue that was hard to leave alone. Every place you went, they were talking about it. And if you went to Central Oregon, it was the big issue over there. And my nephew, who drove for me during that campaign, tells the story about us being in Central Oregon, and I was on my way to give a um, noon speech to the chamber, one of the organizations over there. And I got up that morning and put on my, a red suit my red, my best red wool suit. And my nephew looked at me and said, Annie Barb, you're really not going to do that, are you? You're not going to wear that red suit to that speech in, in, in Bander, Redmond. And I said, yes, I am. I said, nobody owns the rainbow. I'm wearing this suit. And he said, boy, I think you're making a huge mistake. And we stopped at a coffee shop on our way that morning and walked into this restaurant in a little teeny town in central Oregon and it was dead silent in that room. You could have heard a pin drop. They looked at me in this red outfit and they were not happy. And my nephew said, see, I told you. I told you you shouldn't have done that. I said, Craig, it's okay. We just can't let people determine who we are by what color we wear. And I am not gonna quit wearing things I want to wear because somebody else thinks that color belongs to an organization or a religion or anything else. Uh, and so I wore the red suit and delivered a lunch speech that day. But it was, it was that kind of issue. It really had people angry and upset and divided. As the race went on, one of the things that began to happen was I, I got more endorsements. It, more, the further we got into the general election, the more 
newspaper endorsements I got. It felt as if I were in a winning position. And Ron Blankenbaker, who used to write for the Salem Statesman, said the race was over in, you know, in early October, said this race is done, and, you know, we should, they should quit doing debates because it's clear Barbara's run the race. And, um, and when, I, when the race was over, I, in fact, had won by a very, very substantial margin. Uh, I'd raised less money than Donna, and, um, but I, I just went into that race feeling like if I worked hard enough and if I was clear enough about my positions and if I behaved like I thought a statewide office holder ought to behave in terms of responsible behavior on the campaign trail, that um, I would win, and I did. The thing that I would tell you about that, Donna and I are still friends. I mean, we're on the email together once in a while. And, uh, um, but, but out of that race, um, I found out it was different to run for statewide office, not just because it was bigger than to run for local office, because you might think, well, gee, I'm in Burns today, so it's okay to say what I want because I'm not in Portland and they won't know what I said over here. Didn't work that way. The press, whatever you said, because it was statewide, got into the paper and got picked up on the wire in the whole state. So if you said something in Burns or you said something in Klamath Falls or in Ontario or in Medford or Coos Bay, you may as well put it on the front page of the Oregonian because that's where it was gonna be. And so you better be pretty clear about who you were and where you stood and you didn't get to play games with it. And in a legislative race, you get a little leeway because people aren't really paying attention to what you say to that degree. They are in a statewide race, even, that's, even the Secretary of State's race. It was a really good um, reminder about taking positions and being ethical when you campaign. And uh, uh, I got a lot more courageous, I think, during that campaign because I realized I was gonna take some stands that people didn't like. Um, I was pro-choice and abortion, and it was on the ballot, and uh, I was very clear about my pro-choice position. Some people didn't like that. Um, I didn't waver on it when I campaigned. Uh, so whatever the issues were, and some of them would be controversial, and some of them would be different in different parts of the state, but you had to be pretty clear, I thought, about who you were, and, and you didn't get to spin things from one part of the state to another. Um, I had, I mean, it was amazing. My staff thought it was the stupidest thing they ever heard of, that I thought there was an asset in being uh, a descendant of Oregon Trail pioneers. Well, it's because they lived in Portland. I knew what was gonna happen when I got to Baker City. And when I was in Pendleton, where my grandmother was born just outside of Pendleton, and I knew that was gonna matter when I got to Corvallis, where my dad was born. And so when I moved around the state, I had history. And that history seemed much more important east of the mountains than it was west of the mountains. And that was a really, turned out to be a really good um, asset for me. Uh, people felt a little more comfortable that I was from Portland if I had roots in Oregon. And that helped me when I was east of the mountains a lot. And uh, so when I was sworn in as Secretary of State, I did one thing that, um, was in every paper in Oregon. The Portland Gay Men's Chorus sang at my swearing in as Secretary of State. It's the first time it had ever happened in the nation that a gay chorus sang at a statewide office holder swearing in. Um, Grant and Karen said, you'll never get elected to anything again. He had just run for treasurer and lost and he was the MC for the event. He said, oh, Barbara, you can't do this, you can't do this, so you'll never get elected again if you do this. I said, Grant, this is the first day I'm gonna serve in public office as a statewide office holder. If I don't stand for something on the first day I hold statewide office, I'll never be, I'll never be brave enough to stand again. And he just kept shaking his head. And in every newspaper, it said, you know, sworn as Secretary of State, Portland Gay Men's Course, every article in every newspaper of any size in the state. And you know, it never came up again. Nobody ever raised the issue with me in the rest of my political career, except as an asset. Um, but they were the best chorus in Oregon. Without any question, they were the best chorus in Oregon. I wanted the best chorus, and I got it. And, um, but it was, uh, people thought it was a really risky thing to do, and it was not intended to be kamikaze. 
it was really about standing up for who you were and what you believed in on the first day you took statewide office, and I did that. Um, it made everything else easy in comparison. <laughs> I, I have a thing that I tell young candidates who are running for office. It's why would you stand for election if you don't stand for anything else? And it's I really believe that. I think you have. I mean, I think you have to have a little bit of courage, be a little bit of a risk taker, or you can't be a leader. And if you're not a risk taker and you have no courage and no passion, you should take up some other field of work. You know, don't hold my offices in my state. First, a little one, a little one, but it feels big because I care about it. The state motto on the, on the state seal says the union, and it was the state motto of the state for many years. But back under the territorial government before, it was a Latin phrase. And when, we, when I was Secretary of State, I was in charge of the state seal. We used to tell them people we fed it fish in the basement. But I was in, in charge of the state seal. And the Union flag was across there that said the Union. And so when we looked up the territorial motto, I said, gosh, this is the most boring, this is the most boring motto for a state. How do we get such a boring motto? And so we did a little research and went back to the territorial motto, and it was in Latin. And when we had it translated, it translated to she flies with her own wings, which I thought was beautiful. And I thought was Oregon. It was so Oregon. And I said, gosh, we should go back to this territorial motto. And so I actually introduced a bill into the legislature to, to go back to the territorial motto, but in English. And it passed the legislature, and the state motto became, she flies with her own wings. And it wasn't a big thing. It wasn't... Uh, earth-shaking, but I thought it so described Oregon, and I so loved it that I really wanted to, um, to do that. And it's still in place in spite of the fact that um, after I left the governorship, Kevin Mannix raised a, actually introduced a piece of legislation to go back and change it to the union again, and the legislation failed. Um, every woman in uh, both parties voted against him. Um, it was just, they just decided it was an unkind thing to do and that the motto was beautiful and we should keep it. So that's a little thing, but it's one I like a lot. I'm responsible for the State Archives building. Um, when I first became Secretary of State, the State Archives were housed in an old hops warehouse in Salem that was a fire trap, first of all. It was a fire trap. The other half of the building was an, a discount carpet warehouse. They, the, there was moisture in the building, there was huge fluctuations in temperature, summer to winter, and our, our papers, our state papers were stored there. The first thing I did in the first week I was Secretary of State was to bring the territorial papers, as many of them as we could, the state constitution and any other papers of real value, and put them in the safe in the Secretary of State's office in case that damn place burned down. I couldn't even talk about what a fire trap it was for fear somebody would set it on fire. Uh, I talked about it behind the scenes, but I actually introduced a bill to the legislature to, to do a um, design and a study to create a new archives building. And we knew that they were moving out a bunch of houses at the end of the mall, um, on the north end of the mall, and that there really was a site that we could use. And so I took the legislation, really it was mostly a ways and means bill, to get the money to do the design of the building and begin the architectural fees and costs and so forth. And then came back the next session after we had all that done, came back with the design, the cost, the location, all of that, and came back to the legislature and they approved the building. Um, so it, um, we got the new archives building built, and it was being built, well, uh, just finished while I was uh, running for governor uh, in 1990. So it had taken a while to get it there, but uh, it took actually three sessions of the legislature to get it all the way done. And, um, I mean, we moved, the building came in on bu under budget, on time, and it's a wonderful building, and all of Oregon's historical state papers are now housed there, protected, handled properly, um, displayed on occasion. It's one of the things I'm really proud of. 
when we were still going to the polls to vote and weren't doing vote by mail, we, uh, I got a 13-hour election day instead of 12. Polls opened an hour earlier in the morning for people who went to work early. Uh, we worked on handicapped accessibility. A lot of voting at that time was done in church basements and, you know, buildings that were not accessible. And we started taking um, polling places out of basements of people's houses and church basements and other places that didn't have elevators or accessibility. And we moved a lot all over. We were trying to get every polling place in the state accessible to the disabled. And we were able to do that. Um, and we worked for about four years to get all those locations so we could do that. Of course, then we didn't need them later because we, we were doing vote by mail. Even though I was not a supporter of vote by mail, uh, I worked to expand it while I was Secretary of State. Uh, one of the other things we did was straighten out the reporting laws for financial reporting for candidates. They were a mess. And there were so many loopholes in them, you could drive a truck through it. And I decided if we were going to have them that not only did they need to be there, they needed to be clear, and when people didn't abide by them, they needed to be treated when they were fined for abuse of the law, they needed to be treated equally no matter who they were. And so we created a matrix that said how much you'd pay each day for whatever, or late fees or whatever it was. Well, we never thought about people really, 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 really being late. The first major fine that I did was against the Democratic House caucus. <laughs> Shirley Gold was caucus leader, and I fined them several thousand dollars. It was a huge fine, but that's what the Matrix did. When you went down it, that's what the fine was, and I wouldn't make an exception for anybody. And so at least when people, they figured out that this was serious, and they, they would get things done on time, and they would be accurate, and that's what the law was intended to do. And I served on the land board in, uh, as Secretary of State. That's one of the other roles of the Secretary of State. And we were working, one of the things we worked hardest on, and I learned a lot, um, but it was also we were dealing with the forest lands um, of Oregon, and that was, it turned out that that was another thing when I became governor. I was grateful that I'd had the experience on the timberlands, uh, the state-owned um, timberlands as a is sort of a learning experience for me as I begin to deal with a spotted owl, owl issue as governor. So, you know, I, I felt really good about the work I did as, as um, Secretary of State. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things I would add about it is that apparently we were doing something right during that period of time. The legislature kept giving me new responsibilities. Secretary of State got the Corporations Division, We've got the Historical Properties Commission. Um, uh, we got, I'm trying to remember, there were about six or seven new responsibilities that the legislature, oh, in, in performance audits, that the legislature gave to the Secretary of State during the time I was governor. So we had, we had a big increase in staff and money. I mean, I think we had over 200 people working for the Secretary of State's office in the last, uh, my last session of uh, in Secretary of State, and we had, huge increase in our budget because we had a lot more responsibility. So the legislature must have felt good about what we were doing in the office, and that made a difference. Also, while I was serving as Secretary of State, I chaired the um, long-term care uh, financial committee looking at the cost of long-term care for the governor. I served on the Hanford Waste Board as the governor's representative, and I, um, I chaired a committee for Governor Goldschmidt on workers' comp reform. The first workers' comp reform that came out of the legislature after he was governor came out of my committee before they did the Mahoney Hall committee. He gave me my choice to either reform school finance or reform workers' comp, and I said, oh, God. <laughs> so I did workers' comp, and uh, I think it was a good choice because nobody's figured out how to reform school finance yet. I felt really good about how well managed the agency was when I left and the kind of condition I left it in. And uh, um, I think whenever you uh, have a major responsibility like that, you work to try to make the agencies better. And, uh, and we, we tried to, I just really worked hard, but particularly on the election division, trying to make even the, even the office look better. 
When I was Secretary of State, I belonged to an organization called Women Executives in State Government. And in order to belong to it, you had to be either be a statewide elected officer or a cabinet um, officer reporting directly to the governor in states where they have cabinets. And I belonged to, to Women Executives in State Government all the time I was Secretary of State. And um, so every year, four women out of that organization uh, received a major fellowship to go to the Kennedy School of Government to do three weeks of executive training uh, in leadership at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Um, and in 1989, I applied for one of the fellowships and got it. It was absolutely the most intense three weeks I think I've ever spent. And uh, they just pushed you all the time. There were about 70 people, 65 or 70 people in the class. Now this is sort of hard to believe, I know, but I was in my 50s and I was Secretary of State, the second highest office in this state. And I didn't know I was a leader. I knew I had a prominent leadership position. I knew I was a manager. I knew I could make decisions and do influence people. It didn't occur to me that made me a leader. Now that's pretty hard to imagine, I know, but women weren't used to seeing themselves as leaders. So here I was in this position as Secretary of State in my 50s, and I don't recognize I'm a leader. But at Harvard, I recognized it. At Harvard, I began to understand that I had real leadership skills and qualities. It's hard to believe I didn't know that before, but I didn't really understand it. So I came back feeling differently about myself. Now that didn't really change anything for probably anyone but me at the time. But had I not done that, had I not reevaluated myself and seen myself as a real leader, I don't think I would have ever run for governor. So six months later, Neil Goldschmidt drops out of the governor's race a month before the filing deadline. He drops out of the race unexpectedly, and the next day I announce I'm running for governor. I always tell people, had I not spent those three weeks at Harvard, I don't think I would have been able to do that then. It's not that I didn't want to be governor someday, but I, you know, I had this vision. If I wanted to be governor, I had to finish my second term as Secretary of State. I was now serving in my second term, but I had to finish that. Then I had to go back and finish my degree had to do that, and then someday I could maybe run. I mean, that's the way in my mind it looked. And now here was this incredible opportunity, though most people didn't think of it as an opportunity because they didn't think I could win. Um, here was this wonderful opportunity with no notice, short, just there, and I had to make a decision, and I did. So on the day after he announced he wasn't running, I announced I was. and. People kind of, um, they said what a good sport I was. How nice of me to carry the party ma banner. Um, how wonderful it was that I was willing to do this, you know, kind of run against Dave Frohmeyer, who was in the race and been in the race for a year and had raised over a million dollars already. And how nice of it was for me with my $12,000 and no campaign to get into this race. And it was, it was just really good of me to do this so that the Democrats would have somebody to lose. And uh, I mean, that's how they that's how they responded to it. They sort of patted me on the head like a cute, imaginative child, I guess, and and s said, "This is really sweet of you, dear." And um, and I literally started that race. Frank thought I could win. My dad thought I could win. My campaign manager didn't think so. My mother didn't think so. <laughs> None of my friends thought I could win. But they were all proud of me because I'd done this. I knew it was a really long shot. I was starting a year behind and a million dollars behind. But I was going to go at this to win. And um, the first poll we did, in-house poll, not public, I was 27 points behind Dave. 27 percentage points is a huge, huge issue when you don't have any money and you don't have a campaign put together. Even if you did, it would be a huge issue. That's a lot of points. And um, I didn't have a primary opponent, so I, 
I, I could get through the primary just raising money and not spending it, holding on to as much of it as we could, and working, working my tush off all over the state. I work so hard, I can't tell you how hard I work. And we organized a campaign, we put a campaign staff together, we started raising money. The first piece of luck looked like bad luck. The first piece of luck I had after I got in the race, as soon as the primary was over, the Oregon Newspaper Publishers Association had a joint appearance between Dave and I over in Bend. And it was not really a debate, it was a joint appearance. They wanted to look upon both of us and we were now officially the nominees. And, and so it was the first time we'd really appeared together in that kind of way. And there was, they were asking questions and you know, and they would ask a question, Dave would answer, I would answer, and we would, you know, we, we both answered every question, and, you know, economy and education and all of those things you might expect. And, and, um, and we got to the very end, and um, they ha said they had time for a couple of questions that the audience could ask. Now, these, this audience are news pub publishers and editors. So I don't remember what the first question was, but I do remember what the second question was. The second question was, how are you going to, going to vote on measure, and I can't, can't remember the measure number, but how are you going to vote on the measure to close Trojan nuclear power plant? Not how do you like it, what do you think about it, how are you going to vote on it? I knew how I was going to vote. I was going to vote to close Trojan. And I'd served on the Hanford Waste Board. I felt pretty strongly about our inability to store the waste, and that's how I was going to vote. So I answered the question that way, and I made the comment about my time on Hanford Waste Board and what I knew about nuclear storage and a number of things. It really didn't make any difference what I said after I said I was going to vote for it. Every editor and every newspaper person in the room, you could just see go, big writing. I mean, they were just writing, oh my God, this is the most awful thing, I can't believe it. And Dave Frommeyer, of course, did what he should have done. He stood up and said, well, you know, we have to be concerned about the energy for our economy. And, you know, this is a big, you know, big economic, you know. And, and he did exactly what he should have done, considering. That day, two of the members of my finance committee for the campaign quit, said, we're done. We're not going to support you. This is all over now. And... They, they disagreed with my position, but they also thought it was so suicidal that I couldn't win. And so I went back to the campaign office the next day, and people weren't sure what to do. I mean, they were kind of like, now what? You know, she slit her throat, I guess. They didn't disagree with me in the office. They just thought it was, I shouldn't have maybe said it. But since nobody thought I could win, it didn't matter anyway. And so by the afternoon of that next day, People started coming to the campaign office with checks, with offers to help, with um, volunteers that they could bring to us. We got checks in the mail on the second and third and fourth day. We started getting checks from people who said, thank you for your courage. Thank you for standing up. Thank you for understanding nuclear power. Thank you for just being brave enough to tell the truth. Um, I mean, it was amazing. We had this huge influx of money and people that came as a result of this. So we stood back and said, wait a minute, maybe we're not done here. Um, so that was the first piece of luck, and which felt like bad luck. And the question might never have been asked. If it hadn't been asked, I wouldn't have been able to define myself that way. And then um, as the campaign went, went on, the, the spotted owl was listed and the whole timber issue, the spotted owl timber crisis just rose to the top. And it was a, um, it was the most polarizing issue I've ever dealt with in my life, more than abortion, more than gay rights, more than anything. This totally polarized people, you're on one side or the other, there was no middle ground. There should have been, but there wasn't. And so Dave, you know, was getting the support of the timber industry, and I wasn't because I had said that I supported the Endangered Species Act, which I did. It's a federal law, it's a state law, and I supported it. And um, I believed that we could work around this, through it, um, and I talked about it, and you know, in very reasonable kinds of terms. It didn't matter how reasonable I was. 
you know, timber communities hated me, and Dave got was getting all their support and money, and um, and I continued to talk about alternatives, and um, so I went to deliver a speech um, to um, one of the big timber associations, and in the course of the speech, I, I did the history of, of timber in Oregon, you know, the report that came out in 1936, the year I was born, and this is what it said, and we'd have listened, we wouldn't be in this mess now. I did all that. I, uh, I, was, I was professional, I was academic, I was historical. And sometime in the course of the speech, I used the phrase, sometimes you have to play the hand you've been dealt. Well, to me that meant it was a tough hand and you weren't gonna get a lot of help, but you played it. I never talked about tossing the hand in or not playing the hand. I said, sometimes you have to play the hand you've been dealt, and Oregon's going to have to do that if we're going to get through this tough time. Well, the next day, that was the phrase that everybody was using against me. Barbara Roberts thinks we should quit. We should just let the timber industry go down the drain. I mean, I came from a timber community. I knew better. But that's not what the phrase meant to me. Playing the hand you've been dealt did not mean throwing in the hand. So anyway, so that whole issue was bubbling all over the state, and I was getting beat up about that issue. But three things happened late in the campaign that, well, we're about four, four things. It's, and this is important about, the, about timing and strategy and luck. The first thing was, out of every dollar we got in the campaign, we saved 50% of it, 50 cents out of every dollar went into our media account and it couldn't be spent for anything. It was for the fall media, and it was our television buy. And so it didn't matter what else we couldn't pay for, the media account got half of the money. So we saved it and saved it and saved it, and we're going through May and June and July, and we're working up to August. And in August, it's not really campaign time. People aren't paying attention. Oregonians are out camping and water skiing and whatever we do in the summer, we're doing it. Everybody knows that it's a dead time politically. Well, it's also a cheap time to buy TV. And we looked at that August and said, you know, we could spend our campaign money, media money, in August. And, and it's a huge risk. If we do it and it doesn't work, we're dead. We're finished. But we knew that the Oregonian always did a poll on Labor Day weekend. And that poll would come out just as the Labor Day weekend ended on the Monday of Labor Day, that poll would come out. And if I was 20 points or 15 points or 10 points behind Dave, I was basically done anyway. So we, we did, we taped spots and we spent our entire media account in August on television when nobody supposedly is watching except every senior citizen in the state, apparently. Um, we spent the entire budget, everything, in August, contrary to any kind of intelligence or strategy. And we ran the spots. They were all positive, wonderful leader, great history, cares about Oregon, you know, leadership skills, blah, blah, blah. We did, you know, Barbara Roberts can walk on water. And we did that through all of the money. And they ran in August, and people started saying, saw your spot, saw your spot, great spot. You know, people are watching it. Now we know people are watching it. We just don't know how many people, and we don't know what it means. When the Oregonian poll comes out, I'm only five points behind. We've obviously moved a whole bunch of people, probably 10 percentage points or so, in August when well, nothing else is on the air. We're the only thing and it's all positive. So now it's September, first of September, and I'm five points down. In um, uh, early October, my father died. So we stopped the campaign for five days. We announced that we're not campaigning. We take everything that we might have had on the air off We'd, I don't do any public appearances. I plan my father's memorial service, and I do what's necessary to do. And <laughs> class act Dave Frommeyer pulls everything off the air. 
takes all his stuff off the air and he gets a five-day vacation. But people begin to tell me that something's on the air every day. I don't look at it ever. I've never seen it. I've got copies of it, but I've never seen it. And it's pictures of my dad. When, when Dave Frohmeyer and I and the other two guys in the race, whenever we did a debate, my mother and dad came to the debate, whether it was in Pendleton or Forest Grove, didn't matter. They came to the debate. So every time when the debate would get over, my dad would come up on the stage and give me a big hug. So on television, the running Barbara Roberts dad hugging her in Pendleton, in Medford, in Salem, and, and it goes on. Well, what do you think people at home are seeing? People are saying, she must be a really nice person because her dad loves her, you know? So they're seeing this relationship between my father and I. Well, that's not good luck. But what it did was give people another sense of me that was incredibly important right at that stage. Not a tough politician, not this really stern, serious candidate for governor, somebody's daughter. Well, it is worth a million bucks. I mean, it really is. If my dad could have planned it, he would have done it. Um, but, it, I mean, he was so convinced I was going to win this race from the beginning. So that happened. That's a piece of luck. It's not something you strategize. It's nothing you can know. It's a terrible piece of luck. But the end impact of it was really positive for me. And then we're coming to the end of the debates. Dave and I have been debating, and... In part of the debates, or most of the debates, the other two candidates in the race. So we're down in Eugene. We're down in Eugene, Dave's town. And there's a debate the next day. Frank is in the hospital. Um, they, he has had a, he got in a horrible uh, accident and he had to have a hip replacement. He, he was in his wheelchair and it, f and it fell off of a TriMet lift and he had to have a, a hip replacement and the hip replacement got infected. Well, the next morning I call him and he's not in the hospital. I said, where is he? And they said, he's in surgery. I said, what do you mean he's in surgery? Well, it turned out the, that the hip replacement had come apart in some way and they had to go in and repair. I'm preparing to do this big important debate in Dave's hometown, but it's also a very democratic town, a very liberal town. And so, you know, I feel pretty good about being in Eugene, except Dave lives there and his lovely family lives there and it's kind of hard. Four people in the debate. Here's where luck comes in. There's a press panel and they're asking questions. So they're taking turns. Who's first, who's last in the, with every question. We get down to the last question in the debate. The last question and the press person asks this ingenious question. He says, if you were not a candidate in this race and you could not vote for yourself, of the remaining three candidates, for whom would you vote? Now that's a really that's a tricky question. Well, here's where the luck comes in. I'd been first last time, so I'm gonna be last on this question. The Libertarian said, I couldn't vote for anybody else but me. I'm the only one who cares about the rights of people. And he did a very Libertarian thing that you would expect him to do. And then, the conservative independent does, I'm the only one moral enough in this group to vote for. He does this moral thing about, about Christianity and, and, and morality and everybody else is too liberal and he's the only person he could vote for, he would vote for himself. Well, now it's Dave's turn. Dave's a reasonable and a very intelligent man. I know he's not gonna do that. So Dave Frommeyer says, I'm the only candidate in this race qualified to be governor, and I would have to vote for myself. Well, I never ran as a woman running for governor, like, excuse me, I'm going to be the first woman governor. If I win, you want to vote for me. I never talked about being a woman as a candidate. But this was too easy. This was like luck, the setup. I said, unlike my male opponents, I'm going to answer the question we were asked. If I was not a candidate in this race and I could not vote for myself, I would cast my vote for the only other person on this stage prepared to be the governor of Oregon, Dave Frommeyer. Well, the place went, whoa! <laughs> and that night, they ran it on television all over the state. In fact, they ran it the second day. 
Everybody was talking about it. It was like the big deal. The next debate is in Portland. We're all four on the podium again. Debate, same format as the one in Eugene. And the last question from the, one of the reporters is, last week in Eugene, the four of you were asked a question. Not all of you answered it and we're gonna give you a chance to answer it again today. Here's the luck again. I'm last again today. I'm last. The libertarian does the same thing. The conservative independent does the same thing. Now it's Dave. He's gotta redeem himself, right? He's gotta redeem himself. He knew that wasn't the truth. So Dave answers the question and said, if I were not a candidate in this race and could not vote for myself, I would write in my wife, Lynn, who is a Democrat. So he just said he'll vote for a Democrat, he'll vote for a woman, but he won't vote for me. And I said, deja vu. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna give you the same answer I gave you in Eugene last week. Now, the televisions ran both of them, side by side, side by side, showed them both. It was worth, I can't tell you how much it was worth, but everybody knew that he hadn't told the truth. And it really, really set badly with people. They really didn't like it. Um, it was a sign that Dave Frommeyer was being overmanaged. He was a better man than that. He was more honest than that. And I think if they'd have left him to his own devices, he wouldn't have done that the second time. This is something they strategized about all week. And it was a really bad mistake. And um, I was just very lucky. I just was at the right place at the right time. We went into that election night not knowing who was going to win. I remember the morning of election, they put um, security, state police security on both Dave and I that morning because they didn't know who was going to win. One of us would be governor at the end of that day. And um, I remember those state police officers doing security with me that morning and during the course of that day. and. Um, and thinking how unusual that was and thinking, I wonder if I'll have them tomorrow. <laughs> Cause you didn't know. I mean, so, I mean, it was, and my staff was all tense on election night. I was absolutely not tense on election night. I'd done everything I could do. There was nothing else left to do. And I just relaxed and enjoyed the evening and held my granddaughter and, uh, um, who I hadn't seen nearly enough of, and just, you know, Frank and I just enjoyed it and uh, spent time with my mother and my sister, who were all excited, and uh, and had both worked on the campaign as volunteers and, um, and won. I stood up for what I believed in from the beginning of the campaign to the end, and uh, I remember walking into, in Coos Bay, walking into a timber rally with a stage way across this big parking lot and stage was way down there. It was like a county fair kind of stage. Walked into the back of that, my state police are saying, are you sure you want to do this? You know, but I mean, and I, I went right through the crowd. I just went right through the crowd and spoke to them. Hard stuff, hard stuff. But you know, it's what you have to do. It's what leading is all about. So, I mean, I always felt really, um, lucky to have come out of that race as a winner. Um, I felt privileged to have the people of the state give me enough votes to get me elected governor. Um, and I felt really proud of the kind of campaign we ran and the forthrightness with which we delivered our messages. Uh, it, was, it was a good race and Dave and I both worked hard, but I just, I, had, I think I had some assets he didn't have. And one of them was my ability to be totally forthright about who I was and what I stood for and to not let um, campaign consultants control who I was. That's a hard thing when you're running in a major rock because right away they start, they start remaking you. And uh, I didn't want to be remade. I was, I was okay with myself and, uh, and it turned out so were the people of Oregon. <laughs> the passage of Measure 5 had a huge impact on state government at the legislative level, in the governor's office, at the budget, in local school districts, community colleges, local government. I mean, that referendum had as much effect on this state as anything in modern history. 
and uh, and still is having an effect, most of it negative. Um, but it, it, I mean, I, I can't think of many things, many measures that have had a much bigger effect than that one did. Some of the get tough on crime, crime measures, those referendum measures, the Kevin Mannix measures, um, they really um, messed up what I thought was a really pretty good correction system that was working really fine. And we had focused in the time I was governor, we were really focusing on alcohol and drug programs and, and education programs and anger management programs. I think the recidivism rate for adults in Oregon's prison system dropped, dropped like 35% while I was governor. And part of it was because we were not letting people out of prison who didn't have some kind of skills and, and their alcohol and drug problems under control and a job and a place to live. I mean, we really were working and sending them back out prepared to stay out of the prison system. And when those measures passed, there were three or four of them that passed, um, Measure 11, the most notable, but others. And we were suddenly building new prison beds and and there was no money left over for, for services to prepare people to live on the outside again and be productive. Um, I, I mean, I just think it, it changed everything. Millions of dollars more were being spent to house people, younger and younger people for longer periods of time for smaller and smaller crimes. and instead of Oregon building new schools or funding higher education, we were funding more prison beds and, and less services for people who were in them. The first response was that I had to cut the budget. We had to cut, you know, $500 million out of the budget. That was the first response. And we did that. Um, my budget took those monies out and tried to do it in an effective way. Uh, we started working on ways to make state government more efficient and more effective. We looked at um, the management to employee level in every state agency and said are we overmanaged in these agencies. We quit filling positions when they were vacated uh, by retirement or uh, resignations as people left state government and quit filling the positions at the level we've been filling them before. So we did a whole lot of things to try to make the government more efficient, more effective. Um, the Oregon benchmarks were part of that process so we could focus on something that was going to give us an outcome and do outcome-based government. And um, Oregon was recognized for the kind of efficiencies we were doing during that time. Financial World magazine said that we were the seventh best managed state in the nation while I was governor. We'd been 27th before, so we really were managing the government much better. I felt I had to do that before I could ask anything else of Oregonians. When we did the conversation with Oregon, we were looking for a way to try to both garner information from Oregonians about what they wanted their government to be, and also to be able to educate them about the realities of how state and local budgets work. You know, how much taxes we raised, what kind of taxes they were, where they came from, where they were spent. You know, we had thousands of people involved in that process all over the state, and um, they came away understanding budgeting better, state budgeting better, local budgeting a little better, uh, understanding where the state's money went. We had to show them where the money was spent so they'd know that getting rid of LCDC or some other agency they didn't like wasn't going to solve the problem. Um, if they wanted to get rid of the state police or whatever they wanted to get rid of. Uh, it wasn't probably going to be enough to solve the, the really big uh, issues and the big budget issues. So we did a lot of education of the of the 10,000 people or more that participated in that. And and then they, they helped us design a new tax structure, saying, okay, we now know what your priorities are, we know what you want, we know where you want to spend your money, we know what you think about the fairness or unfairness of certain kinds of taxes that you've learned about, now we want you to help us design a tax structure. And out of all the questionnaires and all the meetings and all the work we did, we came up with a design for a tax structure. And it was a really fair and balanced tax structure. It was the first major reconstruction of Oregon's tax system in many, 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 many years. It looked at corporate taxes and income taxes and property taxes and sales taxes and every kind of a tax you can think of and the com combination of them. So people were a lot more sophisticated when they came through that process. And we know, knew a lot more about what citizens wanted. We designed the tax measure. Uh, we got a lot of endorsers for it from labor and business and 
and social service agencies and all kinds of groups. And we brought the, the, the measure to the legislature to have them put it on the ballot. And it passed the Senate and failed by the House, by two votes in the House on a procedural vote, a party line procedural vote. Larry Campbell was the Speaker of the House and on the, the, the motion to reconsider where we knew we had the votes to send it to the ballot and uh, they would not vote for reconsideration because the caucus position of the Republicans that day was that they not vote for reconsideration. So by two votes we lost the, the measure in the House and it never got to the ballot. So this year of work and this lovely brand new tax structure that was going to be on the ballot, would it have passed? I don't have the foggiest idea. But because a lot of people in the public felt they'd help design it, and because there had been so much attention to process, we thought there was a chance that it would pass, uh, but we never found that out. It was my greatest political defeat of my career, without any question. Um, it's still a good measure. It'd be a good measure on the ballot today. If it was that good of a measure. Um, I, I felt very positive about it, and it was very disturbing when all I wanted to do was put it on the ballot to lose it. Obviously, uh, people knew that would be a political injury for me, and um, and the Speaker of the House uh, knew that you know I would be looking at a second term pretty soon, and this would be an injury so big that I probably couldn't overcome it, uh, that it would be a huge political loss, and it was. Um, and so we never knew, you know, we don't know what would have happened to it had it been on the ballot. It might have failed, but I would have liked to have had the opportunity to find out. And after that, nobody ever really took another shot at it. So you couldn't really fix Measure 5 without going back to the ballot and getting a change in the state constitution. And John Kitzhaber wasn't willing to do that, and nobody's willing to do it today. It's just too big of a risk, and people won't take that risk. Well, let me take the environmental one first because it's the one people usually know the least about, I guess. Audrey McCall once said to me, Governor Roberts, you're the best environmental governor since Tom McCall. I was really proud of that. But I really worked on a lot of environmental things, and though they weren't all as um, high profile as the, as the um, issue of the spotted owl and timber, I stopped the dam from being built on the last free-flowing part of the Cl Klamath River. Uh, it took me four years, but I got it done. And um, there was no reason for that dam to be built. It was being built to sell power to California. I fought the city of Klamath Falls and the county of Klamath Falls on that for four years. Um, we got the river listed as a state scenic river, and that didn't save it. And so then I went to Bruce Babbitt, who was the Secretary of Interior at the time, and said, you know, Secretary Babbitt, we've got an issue here, and I need your help. And they ended up, in the last month I was in office, listing it as a federal scenic river, which meant it couldn't be built. So that was a big environmental issue, and I felt very strongly about it. I got the first funding that came in for uh, expanding the light rail in the metropolitan Portland area, which went from Gresham to Portland, or Portland to Gresham, depending on your perspective. And we got the first funding that moved it from there to, um, um, to Hillsboro. And uh, we moved forward on that with federal and state funding, and I pushed really hard on that, which I think is a big environmental issue. We did the first meeting that had ever been done on the issue of salmon in the state where we brought all the players together, the fishermen, the industries, the timber industry, the 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 technicians that you know all of the people who were players in the salmon issue we brought them together and began talking about what we could do to save the salmon and to preserve the the habitat for salmon um, that turned out to be the forerunner to a whole series of things that happened in oregon environmentally over that period of time including water quality issues all over the state and watershed examination all over the state there's no question that the spotted owl timber crisis remained a big issue all during that time. Once the Clinton administration came in, we worked really closely with the Clinton administration to get a forest plan in place that would allow us to harvest in Oregon in a responsible way that met 
the demands of the Endangered Species Act. Prior to that, um, George Bush Sr., George Bush I, was president, and Lujan, who his, was his Secretary of Interior, just wanted to harvest, and they just wanted to throw out the whole thing. And so there was a plan developed about harvesting, and Lujan said it, it didn't meet the requirements, and they were calling in what they called the God Squad. The God Squad was a group of, of uh, um, cabinet-level officials who would be able to move forward without the public kind of process that was required by the law um, before that. And so I sued Lujan. I sued him because he went around the back door and he ignored the report and ignored the, the, the work that had been done and refused to treat it as a serious uh, solution. And so I sued him and won. And um, that meant they had to move forward with developing a plan. All during that time, there was a great deal of controversy that remained in the timber communities, timber workers, um, timber owners, log exporters. Uh, we really tried to find ways to deal with this issue in a legally responsible way that wouldn't keep us in the courts for the next decade. And the Clinton plan turned out to be part of the answer to that. Uh, it allowed some harvest. Um, it brought money in, lots of money in, to Oregon and Washington for displaced timber workers and timber communities to help them revitalize and create new industries and to get new training for those workers. So instead of working in a mill, they might be building highways or whatever the thing was they did with their education money or startup money for businesses. So those millions of dollars came into Oregon, and we worked on that. So there was an environmental component, and there was an uh, economic component to it. And it was the only way we were going to get out of the court system, which we eventually did. But it had huge long-term environmental impacts and long-term economic impacts. And in some communities, there was not a recuperation that, in a way that was satisfying. Um, if you only had one mill in town and that's all there was and that mill closed, there wasn't much else you could do there. So there were some of those kind of communities. But in bigger communities, places like Medford and Coos Bay and, and Springfield, um, we actually turned those around economically and brought new companies in from out of state and out of the country, did a lot of work there. So environmentally, we made a lot of big decisions. Um, estuaries over on the coast, a number of things like that that I worked on. In terms of the education issue, with Measure 5 in place, we were having trouble doing what we needed to do to fund schools adequately, and that included community colleges and higher education. And because the lottery was then in place, just fairly new in terms of its expansion, it was dedicated to economic development in the beginning, and we wanted to turn some of that money into education, so we had to figure out how to how what we did was was both educational and economic development. That allowed us to uh, to use uh, economic development work, uh, money for worker retraining and things of that nature, which put it into community colleges and helped them put it into some higher ed uh, schools. And, and then we had to figure out how we could relate um, uh, K through 12 where there were places where K through 12 would work as economic development. And we did part of that by uh, creating the workforce councils that, that created uh, workforce programs. And in workforce, all things come back to education. So we were able to deal with uh, displaced workers, handicapped workers, um, welfare reform, and a number of things as part of both economic development, but it also impacted education. So we got pretty creative about how we could use it. And then eventually the, the people of the state decided it really part of it should be for education anyway. So it eventually went there anyway, so that we may have led the effort in that just in, in that session. But, but it, was a, it was hard to do education then because it, it was all about cuts at local government level. 
and schools and and the state just couldn't do what it needed to do uh, for education and so a lot of my commitment to education was really challenged during that period of time and trying to find out how we could fund education and fund state government and fund the police and fund corrections and it was all a huge um, uh, competition for dollars and I never felt like education got as much as it needed out of that uh, period of time. Even some of the things I was most committed to, um, I couldn't always help, couldn't save, um, like public employee salaries. I mean, I really believe that people who worked in state government worked hard and really made a contribution to the state. But because of Measure 5, I couldn't always do what I wanted to do for state employees. It was a pretty difficult time to be governor in terms of the things I was committed to, which were good jobs and good salary and, and good benefits and, and uh, good education. And a lot of things were really challenged by the things that were happening with Measure 5. The Oregon Health Plan, I mentioned earlier when I talked about legislative accomplishments that that took a couple of sessions to get the, all of the pieces of the health plan through the legislature. It was a huge accomplishment for the legislature. But then we had a plan with no state money, no federal money, and no federal waivers, which meant you didn't have a plan. And I was determined that as much work as had been done by, by, by uh, Senator Kitzhaber um, while he was Senate president and all the work that had been done by the legislature, that plan needed to go into place. And so I committed myself to not only get the federal waivers but to get federal money and to get state money. And in the 1981 session, on the final day of that legislative session, the money was still not in the bill. It was gonna die without the money. And I, I remember walking into a meeting that I wasn't invited to, where the leadership of the House and the leadership of the Senate and ways and means of both houses were seated together, trying to figure out how they could just adjourn that day. Larry Campbell and, you know, I mean, all of the players were sitting in the room and they were saying, well, we can't get anything else done. We may as well just bring the gavel down. And I let them talk a while and they're trying to figure out what I'm doing in their meeting, uninvited, but I'm there. And I finally said, you know, as far as I know, all of you in this room are getting paid for this whole day. How about you work the whole day? I mean, it was before noon and they were gonna drop the gavel. I said, you've got time to do the rest of this. If you set your mind to it for the rest of this day, why don't you put in a day's work for a day's salary? Um, <laughs> it's pretty brave, uh, pretty stupid probably, but it worked. And they came out of the room and there were four or five things left on the agenda that we really wanted in the top of that list for me was the Oregon Health Plan funding. So we got the funding that day and I worked on the waivers for a long time. Gene Thorne and I went back to Washington, D.C. Uh, we took people from the staff, from all of the people who'd worked on this. Uh, John Kitzhopper went back there even though it wasn't in the legislature anymore. I mean, we did everything we could. and. And finally, we, um, as, as the Bush administration, the first Bush administration left, they left a little legal memo that said, um, does, does this bill that Oregon wants, is this Oregon health plan idea, is it in conflict with the new Disabilities Act, the new Federal Disabilities Act? Just a little question, that was all it was. Well, of course, what that did was flag it immediately for the new Clinton administration coming in. So Donna Shalala came in as, as the head of, that, uh, of the human services or whatever they called that department. The lawyers in the Justice Department looked at this little memo and said, hmm, I have a problem with the disability community. And so they sent, I think it was four lawyers out, and they met with Gene Thorne and I in the governor's conference room. And they're telling us, how there may be an issue with the Oregon Health Plan that they can't give us the waivers because it's contrary to the Americans with Disabilities Act at the federal level. I'm looking at Jean and she's looking at me and we let them talk for a while and then I said, you know, 
I'd like to tell you something about the two people you're talking to. Jean Thorne's husband has been in a wheelchair for many, many years. She lives with disabilities every day of her life. My husband is in a wheelchair as well. And I have a son who is autistic. If you think that either one of us would do anything that would harm people with disabilities, that we would support the Oregon Health Plan if it did one thing that was contrary to the best interests of people with disabilities, you are absolutely wrong. And we will be happy to come to Washington, D.C. and make this point with the committee chair in the House and the Senate. And then Jean gave her little pitch and we, you know, by the time that day was over, the lawyers from Washington, D.C. went away and they went back to Washington, D.C. and the issue of that Disabilities Act compliance went completely away. It was gone. It never came back again. And um, we did a lot of work with Donna Shalala and her staff and people in Washington, D.C. and we got all the waivers. So now we had the waivers and we had the state money and I mean we had a plan. And when Donna Shalala called and said the plan's been accepted, you have all of the waivers. It was like a great day of celebration. So that issue above all others, I mean I think that first period of time there were like 14,000 people who went on the Oregon Health Plan within a few months. It was, a, it was an administrative nightmare to try to do it so fast, but we got people on and people who had no health care, children, families had health care. It was really miraculous. I think that issue is one that I will always feel proud of. I was working with the housing community, I was working with the Bankers Association, and one of the things that became more and more clear around Oregon when you travel all over the state was that we had an affordable housing problem. If you lived in Lincoln City and you were a new police officer and they required you to live in the city of Lincoln City in order to be a police officer on their force, you couldn't afford to live there because it was basically the tourism framework of Lincoln City meant that housing was very expensive. It was true all over the state. We began to find that people, ordinary people doing ordinary jobs couldn't afford to get houses in a lot of places in Oregon. They couldn't get housing. And I decided it was an issue that we'd better take care of pretty soon or we were really going to have a crisis on our hands. It was getting worse and worse. And whether anybody thought it was important or not, I thought it was important. So I started working with, as I said, the banking community and others, raising these questions and raising the issues. So. When I became governor, a bill was introduced by a Republican member of the House uh, to create this housing trust fund, which was the idea I'd talked about all during the campaign. The bill got introduced. I supported it um, um, because when I was elected, not only did Measure 5 pass, but the House went Republican, so I had a little less um, influence in the House than I might have had. And so it was really good to let a Republican member of the House introduce it and take it as his own. But we got the bill through the legislature. And in the four years I was governor, we created the most new units of affordable housing in any four-year period in Oregon's history. And we really made a difference at a critical time on that issue. If you're low income and you don't have a place to live, it doesn't matter what else you have. Without a house, you have nothing. Without a home, a place to go to, to shower, to clean up, to eat, to sleep, you really are in serious trouble. You can't get back on your feet if you don't have housing. The AIDS issue was an issue with me. Um, and it was a period of time when people thought AIDS was only about gay men. And it became clear after a while that this was, that we had an epidemic in the country and that if people didn't begin to understand it, it was going to get worse and worse, and it left the gay community and went into other communities for a lot of reasons, and pretty soon you had young people with AIDS, and you had women with AIDS, and you had people dying of AIDS, and we had to find ways to deal with that issue. And part of it was done with AIDS education money, part of it was by um, services to people with AIDS in communities, um, and also ways to give um, uh, secure reporting so that a person could go in and get tested and their name wouldn't appear with the test results. 
And so you need to have a secure way that you could be tested and have a code. And we worked on that with a number of organizations to make sure you could, that we wouldn't discourage people from being tested. So the benchmarks, instead of measuring AIDS deaths, we measured, we measured new AIDS cases because we thought that's what you should measure. And if you could stop the AIDS from happening in the first place, then you didn't need to measure deaths. You just measured the front end, and we worked really hard on that issue. The Head Start issue, getting funding for Head Start, state, more state funding. I can't take all the credit for that by any means because Frank Roberts led the effort on uh, state funding of, of um, Head Start. You know, there were federal monies, but Oregon had a lot more money in Head Start than a lot of other states because we did state funding, and Frank really led the effort on that. So we worked really hard on that issue, something I really cared about. There were just so many issues. I mean, I just can't begin to tell you, when you're governor, you have such great opportunities to succeed and such great opportunities to fail because you don't win them all. Um, but in the human services area, we did a lot of really good things that I felt very positive about uh, in the correction system, in schools, in low-income areas, in in a in challenged communities and the disability community, the senior community. I continued to do a lot of work in the disability area all while I was governor and looking for ways that we could help that community become part of the workforce and could offer them tools and independent living and some other things that hadn't been really focused on as much before. Um, and the veterans community, I did some work with the veterans community. The funny thing that happens when you become governor is you immediately become the commander in chief of the National Guard. So for the first time in history, the National Guard had a woman commander. Uh, I had an awful time keeping them from calling me ma'am. I told them they could call me anything but ma'am. They hated that, the state police hated that too. But I said, you can call me governor or you can call me barber, but you can't call me ma'am. So whenever I traveled around the state, the state police would always tell state police officers in other communities, don't call the governor ma'am. She doesn't want to be called ma'am. I said, I worked really hard to become governor. I don't want to be ma'am. It's a respectful term. You say sir and ma'am if you're a state police officer because it's very military as it is in the guard. But I didn't want to be called ma'am. So they learned in a hurry that wasn't okay. And so, and I changed National Guard leaders twice while I was, while I was um, uh, governor. Once because there was a vacancy and the second time because I created a vacancy. The first time I filled a vacancy with the guard, I made a bad choice. And I think when you make a mistake, you have to clean your own nest. And I did. And uh, as a result of that, uh, I got a lot more respect out of the guard after that. Um, and, it, uh, and out of that, I gained a really strong working relationship with the leadership of the guard. And uh, to this day, still have that relationship with the people who were there then. Well, I had intended to run for a second term. Um, I, I, I felt like I had a really strong record to run for a second term. My polling wasn't very good at the time, but I felt I had a really strong record to run. Oregon's economy was just absolutely terrific right then. We'd had the greatest investment we'd had in the state's history economically, and I'd worked really hard in Asia and in Korea and Japan and Germany and Italy and working on, on issues of economic development. So our economy was very good. We had the lowest unemployment we'd had in 25 years. As I mentioned, we had all this great new affordable housing. Um, the, the, in terms of prison recidivism, it was really down. The SAT scores were up. AIDS new cases were down. I mean, I just kept looking at the things we'd done. Financial World Magazine's rating of us as the seventh best managed. All the awards we won for the conversation with Oregon and a whole bunch of other things we did during that period of time, I looked at my record and I knew it was really strong. I could run on that record and was prepared to do that. Frank was diagnosed in October of 92 with terminal cancer. And we didn't tell anybody until I think it was June of 93. He was in the legislature, he was serving, he was very ill. 
he was in a wheelchair, so people really didn't understand quite how ill he was, I don't think. And finally, in June of that year, we told people that he was terminally ill and that he did not intend to, um, that he would resign as soon as the legislature was over. And I tell you this because it, it, context maybe is really important in this story. So Frank and I had known since October 92 that he was terminally ill. It's now June of um, 93, and we, you know, we know that he's very, very ill. He's on hospice care at night after he gets home from the Capitol every day. You know, he's struggling to, to get through the session. He really wants to do the rest of the session. Of course, that was at that time the longest session in Oregon history, which we really didn't need. But so in June, he finally decides that he, late June, that he has to tell people what's going on. So his office and my office worked together, and they wrote this press release saying that he had been diagnosed with cancer again and, um, and that he was going to resign his seat at the end of the legislative session and, um, and so that the people of his district could have a new senator who would be able to give the energy and time uh, that was necessary to the work of representing the district. Well, we think when we've written this that it's a pretty clear press release. It seems clear to us. We know what it says. Well, Frank started getting calls in his office, and I started getting calls in my office, and everybody, press calls. You know, what does this mean, blah, blah, blah. You know, so finally Frank called me and said, Honey, I'm going down to the press room and get this done. I don't have time to deal with this 27 times today. I'm just going to go down and explain it, and then I won't have to answer it all day long. And I'd like you to come down with me. And I said, sure, I'll come to the press room with you. You know, I'm going to give him a little moral support. This is a hard issue for him. So we go down to the press room, and Frank says, what is it you don't understand about the press release? I thought it was pretty clear. And they said, well, well are you going to have surgery? Frank said, no, no, I'm not going to have any surgery. And then there's this little pause, and they say, well, when are you starting treatment? And Frank said, well, I'm not starting treatment. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have any treatment. And there's just this, I mean, there's just, you can see all this confusion in the room. No treatment, no surgery, he has cancer. What? And, and, the, and one of the press guys says, we don't understand this, Frank. But could you, I, I mean, what's the deal here? And Frank said, well, let's see if I could be clear with you. I'm terminally ill. I'm dying. I have a terminal diagnosis. And the press room just like, nobody moves, nobody, I mean, everybody just stops. And then one of the press guys, really brave, I thought, said, Senator, when did you get this diagnosis? And Frank said, October of last year, eight months ago. And they're looking and they're thinking, oh my God, he's gone through this whole session knowing he's dying. Oh my gosh, what did we do? What did we say about him? And then they're saying, oh, but the governor's husband is dying. What did we do to her? Did we say something bad about her? You can just see this. I mean, there's like, oh, oh my gosh, we should have been nicer. And, um, and so then the same press guy who asked when he got the diagnosis said, well, when did the governor know? Frank said, well, at the exact same moment I did, she was seated beside me when I got the diagnosis. And it got very quiet, and nobody asked any more questions. Frank thanks them for their time. I thank them, and we walk out of the room. And, it, I mean, it was amazing because we had known for so long that it wasn't news to us, but only a handful of people knew it, our immediate family and a few very close friends. Nobody else knew it. And we'd lived with this diagnosis for eight months, and we'd gone through the awful things that were happening to his body and to him at home and, and working with hospice all the time. So, I mean, we were there. We weren't in denial at all about this. We had accepted this. So out of the story came several things. The fact that Frank was dying, the fact that the governor's husband was dying, almost like a separate story, and the hospice thing. And so then people started wanting to know about hospice. 
So the papers, all of the state did a whole bunch of stories on hospice. It was great for hospice. They got a lot of free press, a lot of good press. And we talked about it, Frank and I, from then on. Once it was out, we talked about the fact that he was dying and that he was not taking treatment and, and that he planned to die at home and that he wasn't going to go into the hospital and, you know, the hospice care. We did all of that very publicly. And um, so when the session ended in August... And Frank came home from the session. Two days after that, I was at a meet. I was on my way to a meeting in Portland, and my office called on the car phone. State police picks up the car phone and says, "Governor, I think this you need to take this call." And it's it's my staff. And Frank has um, couldn't breathe, and they just put him on oxygen, and he's really scared. <laughs> I said, what am I going to do? I, did. I knew this was real, but now it's really real, you know. So he was very, very upset. And so my office says, we're canceling all your appointments. You come home. It's okay. So I'm coming home. You think, oh, that's about the worst news I could get today. We turn around and we start back to Salem. And my sister calls, who works for the governor's office. And she's at the Salem Hospital and they have just diagnosed her with lung cancer. And her husband is out of town. <laughs> and now I've got like, where do I go? I say, you know, do I go home and take care of my husband? Do I go to the hospital, take care of my sister? They've told my sister she, that this cancer is so advanced, she probably only has 5% chance of surviving. And I've got these two people. And so <laughs> I said, Pat, I've got to go home and see Frank. And as soon as I get, I see him, I'll come right over to the hospital and I'll be there with you. And she said, okay, okay. So I go out and take care of Frank and the hospice people are there and they're getting him all calmed down and he's okay now and he knows he can breathe and, and, and he's sort of accepted that this is a new stage in his terminal illness. Go to the hospital, take care of my sister who's just hysterical or semi-hysterical. I mean, it's, it was pretty bad. and. And, and, and she said, what am I going to tell my mother? What am I going to tell my husband? What does this mean? And, and so I've got her just, you know, falling apart and Frank at home. And, and the woman who lives with Frank and I in the governor's residence, our friend Arlene, who's lived with us since we moved into the residence, she's there with Frank and I'm over with the hospital with my sister. She's also a friend of my sister's. And then we changed places and I went home and she went to the hospital. It was just, it was a day from hell. It was a day from hell. And, you know, I think about that sometimes when I think about the decision to not run again. You know, people question that decision sometimes and said, you know, you could, you'd have been okay, you'd have won. And I said, it wasn't a matter of my winning. Frank died on October 31st. John Kitzarb announced in January he was running against me in the primary. Now, if I hadn't had a primary in May, I wouldn't have had to be campaigning very hard in January, and February, March. I'd had a little leeway there, but I didn't have any leeway. Frank had just died. I was a brand new widow. I'd gone through this horrible ordeal, this long, tedious, demanding issue of caring for him at home while he was dying. And John Kitzhopper had announced he's running against me. So now I have the job of governor, which is like a kind of busy job and a full-time campaign, which is what it is, and time to grieve. And I'm looking at this saying, I know what's gonna happen here. I know what's getting left off the list, the grieving time. Now that's what I did with my father. My father dies three weeks before I'm elected governor. I take five days off, I go back to work, I'm a candidate, I win the governor's race, I go right into transition and I'm governor. And I backburnered my grieving for my father. I said, hmm, let's see, we'd like to do that again. Because I figured out what it, what it cost to do that. I knew what it was going to be like if I did that. I knew I'd pay a real penalty later, which is what I do with my dad. So I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that to myself. I'm going to, I have a right to grieve, and by God, I'm going to grieve. And I need to grieve more than I need to be governor again. I've got another year to be governor, I can do that. And that's what I'm gonna do. So when I announced I wasn't running for governor again because 
I needed to take time to grieve. My sister was very ill then. My mother was ill then. She just had another major stroke. So I had my sister under treatment for what they thought was terminal cancer. My mother was sick. Frank had just died. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. This doesn't make any sense. I need to take care of my family, and I need to take care of me. So when I told the press that I wasn't running, and the reason I wasn't running was because of my family's health issues and my grief, they basically said, yeah, sure. We know why. It's because your polling numbers are not good. I mean, that's basically what the stories, in, that's kind of a brief way to look at it, but that's basically what the stories did because they told what I said, and then underneath they all said, actually, her polling numbers stink, you know? I mean, so it was a way of their discrediting what I had said. That said, when my book on death and grieving came out four years ago, I had two different press people read the book. I mean, I don't know how many people read the book, but two, two different people in the press who read the book said to me, oh, my God, Governor, we should have read that book before. I said, well, it wasn't written before. said, no, we really didn't get it. We didn't get what you were going through. We didn't understand what you'd been through, nor did we understand what you were going through. Now we get it, and we were really wrong. I mean, we did not respect what you were saying at the time, and we should have. I mean, I got hundreds of letters from widows who said, thank you for telling people it's hard. It takes time. I mean, people just didn't get it. And, and um, it really, I mean, I knew what I needed to do, and I did it. Uh, I would have loved to have had a second term as governor. I would have loved to have taken the work I was doing and kept doing it. I loved what we were doing for the economy and what we were doing on issues of the environment and people. And I loved all of that. It was really a great thrill for me to do the work I was doing. But, you know, sometimes you just have to take care of yourself. And in this case, I had to take care of myself. And I never regretted it. I never wished I hadn't done it. I never looked back and said, why did I do that? I could have handled that. I never did that. I always knew I did the right thing. And out of it, I mean, I got the great job at Harvard, and I wrote a book. And I don't, I wouldn't have done the book ever. I would have never found time to do the book. But because I didn't run again, the book was there. And so, you know, it, it was a hard decision because I wanted to serve again. And the other thing that made it hard was that Frank wanted me to run again. And... I finally had to get him to give his approval to me that if I chose not to run after he died, that I could not run. Because he said, oh, you, he said, what are you going to do? I'm going to die and you're going to be a new widow and then you're going to be unemployed too? You know, I mean, that was Frank's view of the world. And, uh, and I said, you know, it's like he thought I should get a new husband the next week. But he just thought I should just go right on. And I said, now, Frank, if I died, would you go right on just like today, just like yesterday and the day before? Is that what you'd do if I died? Hmm, huh. I never thought of that. And I said, well, it's not going to work that way. And I said, I'll probably run, but I need you to tell me it's okay if I decide not to. I don't want to have that on my shoulders, you know, that I've disappointed you. No, you're right, he said. You have to decide. You have to decide. So, you know, I really needed that because... I thought, oh, gosh, if Frank really thinks I should run. I have to run, and now he's dead, and I have to do what dead people want. You know, and, you know it's kind of what we all do. You, know, you have to do the deathbed wish. And, and um, so I had his permission to, to, to evaluate it according to my needs at the time, and, uh, and it was a good decision. I have never regretted it. Well, I did four and a half years at Harvard University. I was the director of the state and local government uh, uh, executive program at uh, at the Kennedy School of Government, and also worked on the the women's programs at Harvard. Um, I traveled all over the country and recruited people to the programs and ran the programs, and it was just it was a great job. I loved the job. Um, met a lot of fascinating people, but I missed Oregon. I was there four and a half years. I came home every three or four months, saw my family. Missed the mountains of Oregon and missed the friendliness of Oregon. Uh, 
Boston's not a very friendly place. And, um, and so I wanted to come home. And um, so I came back, and shortly after I got back, I was offered a job by um, at Portland State University, a one-third position at Portland State. And I took that. So I came back with a book, you know, that was in good enough condition. I was decided I was ready for a publisher, and I wanted an Oregon publisher and found an Oregon publisher in New Sage Press. And um, so the book was going to get published, and I was working at Portland State, uh, uh, developing a leadership program for state and local government leaders at Portland State and uh, working at the Hatfield School. Um, and. I suddenly was back involved in Oregon in a way I'd forgotten. Um, I'd always served on so many nonprofit boards, always, my whole life. Suddenly I was working with two women who were creating a, what they call a relief nursery that works with children zero to three who are either abused or neglected or at risk of being abused or neglected. And we formed this a relief nursery in Portland. The three of us started it with original board members. I raised the first $2 million to remodel a building we bought and uh, start the program and I served six and a half years on that board. Um, I was working with um, Compassion in Dying uh, because the new Oregon law on death with dignity was in place by then by the time I came back and I had endorsed it as governor and a little piece of history um, Frank actually introduced that bill into the legislature three times first two times he never even got a hearing on it. It was too controversial. People just were afraid of the bill. The third time he introduced it and it sat in committee for months until they found out he was terminally ill. Then they gave the bill a hearing as a courtesy. It was a big mistake for people who opposed it because for the first time the people who supported it were all in the same room at the same time and they didn't know who each other was before that. So out of that little thing came a sort of a little cabal of people who said, we're going to take this to the ballot. And that's where, how the measure got on the ballot. But it was really Frank's bill originally. It was not very long after Frank died, so it was very hard to do that. But I did, and it passed. So I, when I came back, uh, I was involved um, doing um, speeches and work with, um, with Compassion and Dying, which work, was the organization here in Oregon that was the major advocate for the bill. Got involved with that in a whole lot of ways, did a lot of public speaking on it. And it worked really nicely with my book because I could do the two of them in some kind of... And once the book came out, I was doing speeches all over the state of Oregon, book readings and that kind of thing. And then pretty soon I was doing book readings out of state and in Washington and Idaho and California and Washington, D.C. And so I did a lot of work with the book for a long time. It was a really big issue for me. And I got back involved with the Democratic Party and with the women's organizations and suddenly it was just like stepping back in time again. All the things I'd worked on, the disability community, all of those things I'd worked on before I was in public office and in the early part of my political career, I was back doing all of them again. It was great helping new candidates run for the legislature and uh, um, it was it was like deja vu a little bit, except it didn't lead to the governorship the second time. But but it really was wonderful back doing the things I really cared about again, and you know back with my family. And I spent a lot of time being a grandmother, so I, I spent a lot of time doing family things in that period of time, just really enjoying it. A lot of time seeing friends that I'd missed and hadn't seen much of for the last few years. And I did um, five years at Portland State, and then. Uh, a year and a half ago, um, I resigned my position at Portland State to start a new book and to figure out what it felt like to be retired. So I did almost a decade in education, even though I'd never been an educator before that. So I did almost a decade in a new career, and then I had this sort of semi-career as an author now, and I was speaking all over the country at conferences on death and grieving all the time. I do them all over the country still. And uh, so that became a major part of my um, commitment was to continue to talk about the death and grieving issue at conferences all over the country. And I liked that. I that was really, um, it almost became like a new part of my existence that who would have ever thought that's what I'd end up doing is spending time doing death and grieving, but that's what happened. And, um, and it's something I feel very strongly about. And, and when the Oregon law was under 
um, uh, threat several times in Congress with the Attorney General, with the Supreme Court. I worked really hard, and I've testified in other states about proposed laws they have, like Oregon's. I just came back from California last week. I've been down there doing some lobby work, met with the governor down there, and uh, do press work and fundraising work for them on this issue in California. Just testified a month ago before the Vermont legislature by phone, but testified before the Vermont legislature on this issue. So I'm getting to be sort of the the one of the expert people testifying on this issue, and uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to be in be considered an expert on after this long. But nobody else was governor when it passed but me. So I have a unique way of talking about it with people, and that's really turned out to be great. You know, one thing I want to be sure and say something about um, in my time as governor that I don't, I don't think people talk about very much, and I'd like to just take a minute to say something about it. You know, I mentioned about on election day of being governor, you get the state police in the morning, and you might not have them the next day. Um, and uh, so for four years, I had a dignitary protection unit, guys with guns, as they say, who were everywhere I was. I mean, they did everything with me. Uh, if I went someplace to give a speech or if I went someplace to buy clothing or if I went to church or if I went to see my grandkids, they came with me wherever I went. Now, that can be really intrusive if you think about it. I mean, it, most people would say, wait a minute, I don't want you around all the time. But the truth is, I made up my mind when I first got this dignitary protection unit assigned that I had two ways I could deal with them. They could either be an annoyance or I could treat them like professionals and give them the respect they deserve for the work they did. And I decided I opted for the respect and professional relationship that would allow me to treat them as they should be treated. That if you think about that for a minute, these are guys who are protecting you if somebody wants to hurt you. If somebody wants to harm you or shoot you or harm you in some other way, these are the guys that are going to protect you. Now, if you think about that a minute, just logically, wouldn't you want the guys who are going to put their life on the line for you to like you? Just think about it for a minute. Yeah, I'd want them to like me a lot. And so I thought, first of all, the professionals, they deserve to be treated like professionals. They, the work they do need, needs to be respected. They're not intending to be intrusive. They're doing what they're supposed to do for me. And I can either make them my friends and allies, or I can make this difficult for them and for me. And so because I opted to treat them professionally and with respect. In return, I got respect from them. And not just the necessary respect that's required of their position toward the governor, but more respect than that. And so out of that came some great stories, some just terrific stories about these men, they were mostly men, who spent four years with me. And I'll share two with you because this is a piece of history or not, well, it'll be in my book, but no, nobody else is probably going to ever tell you this piece of history. But between the time I was elected governor and the time I took office, Christmas came. November of election, Christmas, January swearing in. I'm shopping for Christmas gifts in the Lloyd Center in Portland. My mother is with me. Two state police guys are with me. And we're shopping for my now former daughter-in-law, and she wants something, this is so funny, from Victoria's Secret. So my mother and I are in Victoria's Secret with these two state police officers who, was, who were trying to look invisible. And we're walking around looking at, you know, robes and lingerie and all this stuff in, in Victoria's Secret. My mother and I are both wandering around looking, and she's looking for something she wants for my sister. I'm looking for something for my daughter-in-law. And I'm not a very tall person. I'm five, two and a half. And in a place where they hang full-length robes, if you hang a full-length robe, it's taller than I am on a rack. So I walk around behind this rack to look at these robes and don't even think about it. I'm not used to having these guys with me yet. And so I don't even think about the fact 
that the rack is taller than I am. And suddenly, the state police guys look around, and there's two rooms to this store, two separate rooms. You can go through this little archway, and you're in the second room. They check the second room. They don't see me. They walk back in, and he says, I can't get a visual on the governor, you know, speaking into their wrist. I can't get a visual on the governor. And I mean, I don't know they're looking for me. They go to my mother and say, do you know where the governor went? No, I don't know where she went. She was just here. And I mean, they've lost the new governor and it's sort of embarrassing and they don't, you know, so they don't know what to do. I mean, they're looking, they're looking. And, and so one of the guys is backing up. He's trying to get further and further visual by backing up closer and closer so he can see the whole room. He backs into a rack of bras, brassieres, knocks the whole rack over on the floor. It makes a huge noise. Everybody's looking at him. I hear the noise and I walk out from behind where I am to see what's going on, not knowing that I'm the cause of this really. And here is, I mean, the, these are colored bras and they're red and orange and yellow and blue and green and purple and polka dot and they're all over the floor, just all over. And he looks up and he sees me and he says to the other state police, found the governor, governor's here. And, he, and he's bright red and he reaches down and he takes this metal rack and he stands it back up and all over the floor are these bras. And he starts picking them up, they're on little hangers, starts picking them up and hanging them. <laughs> well, it is, it is the funniest thing you've ever seen. Well, you better believe that story got told in every state police officer office in Oregon. That story about that poor officer got told over and over. And of course, we didn't help any because we'd say, Greg, we could go shopping. You know, we could go shopping at Victoria's Secret if you want. Oh, we just gave him such a bad time. So I tell people this is the fun story. But you know, the other thing is, if you think about these guys who, who protected me and on several occasions made a difference in my safety, clearly. But you think about, you know, these are the state police guys, you know, the guys with guns, you know, and you think about, you know, tough, tough guys, you know. And after Frank died, he was cremated. And I bought this beautiful urn for him. It was these dolphins leaping in these waves, this, this beautiful big metallic piece with these dolphins. And it was just absolutely beautiful. And they were waiting to finish a room at the mausoleum where his ashes were going to be placed. And and the urn, and um, it wasn't quite done yet, and so they were finishing the room, and when it got done, he, he was gonna be placed. And so we decided, since we'd waited that long, we'd wait till his birthday on December 28th, and we'd get through Christmas, and then we'd do the placement. And so the, the urn with the ashes in it was at the mausoleum in, in Portland, and, and so I got to thinking about that and thought, gee, he's gonna be there for Thanksgiving and he's gonna be there for Christmas. I really hate that, I don't want him home. So I called the mausoleum and I said, hi, this is Governor Roberts, and they all stand at attention. And, um, and I said, you know Frank's urn that's in your vault? And they said, well, of course we know Frank's urn that's in the vault. Well, can I bring it home with me? And they said, Governor, it's yours. Of course you can bring it home. If you wanna take it home, until it's placed, you can take it home. And I said, oh, yeah, this is a very good thing. So I, we drive to Portland a couple of days later, and we're in Portland for something anyway, and I tell them in advance that I wanna go by the mausoleum and I wanna pick up Frank's urn. And so um, <laughs> the one place they didn't follow me was in the mausoleum. They always stayed on the outside and watched the doors because there were only two entrances into the building. And so I go into the offices and they go to the vault and they, they get the urn out and it's in this black velvet bag. And it's a very heavy piece already, like an art piece. But then it also is filled with ashes and so it's even heavier. So I come out of the mausoleum office carrying this urn. Like, you know, it's heavy. I'm holding it, it's heavy. And one of my state police officers is standing right there, and he says, Governor, let me help you. And he takes the urn from me, and he's holding it, and we walk over to the car. He unlocks the car, opens the back door, 
sets the urn in the back seat, reaches up and attaches the seat belt and pats the urn and says, are you comfortable, Senator? Well, you know, I, you know, I might was, <laughs> you think about this is the guy with a gun. This is the tough guy who's protecting me. And you said, you know, if you lived a thousand years and thought of stories about state police, I don't think you'd think about the story in Victoria's Secret, nor the story about the urn. And it was sort of the two ends of the scale, in a sense, of the relationship that we formed. I mean, they were in the waiting room when my grandson was born. I mean, they, they sat in the waiting room while my grandson was being born. I was in the delivery room with my daughter-in-law and my son. But, I mean, everything that was going on in my life, they did. They did with me. You just don't realize what kind of thing this means. I mean, when Frank got his diagnosis, we'd get back in the car and we're being delivered home by a state police officer. They know what's going on. The call from my sister that day, they're there. I mean, everything that went on in my life, they did with me. And so, I mean, they, from time to time, one of them would come up and, you know, I would want to say, you know, if you want to come up and see Frank, it's okay. You know, so one, once in a while that would happen, not very often, but a couple, of three times. And um, so they did my life with me just as like a member of the family. They knew my parents, they knew my sister, they knew my kids, my grandkids, I mean, all of them. And, all, and you know, my granddaughter was, you know, four and a half when I finished being governor. She knew all these guys by name. I mean, they knew her. I mean, so they were part of my life. And so I, I think of those two stories as a, a way of sort of demonstrating what a relationship can be like when two sets of professionals work together to make it really good. And that's what we got out of that. And I see most of my state police now. I mean, if I go to Pendleton, one of them's there, one of them's in Bend. One of them's in Coos Bay, one's in Philomath, one's in Newburgh. I go see them. One's in Salem. I mean, I see them, and I love seeing them. I'm always happy to see them.